Bonjour. Good morning. I was going to wear my Mickey Mouse hat, but I thought I'd save you that opportunity. Um, thank you, Morton. I am from the world of storytelling. Um, Wired magazine, which I started the UK version about eight years ago, is a magazine that tries to understand how the innovators are building the future, whether it's the startup entrepreneurs, the designers, the architects, the scientists. And so I'm going to share with you some of the things I'm learning about the increasing pace of acceleration in the world of building new business models, new ways that people inside enterprises can interact with customers and each other, and also look a bit further forward about where this is going, and also how we need to adjust our mindset, because there's this goal that every corporation I meet is aiming at, which is this thing called innovation. And it's a very, very hard thing to achieve. And I'm going to give you um, a couple of examples. And I'm also going to share some of the people I've been um, privileged enough to spend some time with lately. I was in the TED conference on Friday last week in Vancouver. And Elon Musk is there talking about one of his new ideas. It's not the Neuralink that you put inside your skull to translate your brain's ideas. It's not about going to Mars. This is just one of his new startups. It's a way of traveling under the traffic. So he's created a company to dig tunnels. He calls it the Boring Company because he got very annoyed at the traffic in Los Angeles where he lives. And so here's one entrepreneur who's got a motor car company that's now the most valuable motor car company in the world. He's got a space rocket company that's reusing spacecraft. And on the side, forget his solar panel business, he's doing this. And the barriers to entry now to create new kinds of businesses are falling. The way that you can turn an idea into new value, it takes some of these very, very driven entrepreneurs. And I'm constantly meeting some of these entrepreneurs because I go to the edge, I go to the research labs, I go to Shenzhen in China to try and understand how they think, but also what their ability to take risks and iterate and be resilient and build things that actually sometimes catch on, what that can tell us about where business is going. So just give you a couple of examples of the range of innovation. I was at the um, Media Lab at MIT a couple of weeks ago Fardell, one of the people I spent some time with, has built a kind of Wi-Fi router that sends radio waves into the next room through a wall. And because of the very precise way he can measure how they bounce back, he can tell not just how many people are in the other room, but what their body postures are, and what their heartbeats are, and what their breathing rate is. And he says soon we'll be able to do blood pressure and what if, just using radio waves at some stage, maybe 10, maybe 15 years away, you could even, for a diabetic, check their blood glucose level. It sounds like science fiction, but it's another researcher using the tools we have, using the increasing collected knowledge to create new ways forward. I met Chanan in the Media Lab, again, in healthcare, She's rethinking the idea of things like pacemakers. She's using the body's movement, pizza electricity, to power these very, very small, flexible films that she's designing that can not just go into the heart and other organs, maybe the brain. So you hear people like this talk, and you think, that's crazy. But think about how we're living and how crazy it would have seemed 10 years ago. And when you think about something like robotics, maybe you think of the big industrial robot. What about the consumer version? This is a company that makes Vespers, Piaggio. It's just revealed its robot suitcase. Seriously, you're laughing now, but in about 18 months, you're going to want one of these following you around the airport. And just to tell you how quickly the whole idea of value is changing, um, this is a guy I got to know in January. He's called Lior. He left a job at Google last January. He was a product manager 
at Google Maps, and he created a startup with his friend Anthony. This is last January. They had no revenue. They had no customers. They didn't even raise funding. They funded it themselves. Within eight months, their startup was sold for $680 million. So we're in a new kind of world of acceleration. Now, this was a, partic a particularly interesting startup. It was making autonomous trucks. It's called Otto. This is a conventional 18-wheeler that drives itself, thanks to a $30,000 retrofit. San Francisco startup Otto, which Uber bought this summer, made history with this truck. It completed the world's first truck autonomous delivery, carrying 50,000 cans of Budweiser from a brewery. This is a very American vision of the future. It's about getting 50,000 cans of Budweiser closer to the customer. <laughs> so what's really interesting about Otto, apart from the fact that Uber and Google are in a massive and very exciting lawsuit, because they were accused of stealing some IP, um, is we've never before had an economy, had technologies that can turn a little bit of IP into a product, into a business that has two-thirds of a billion dollars of valuation in well under a year. And that means if you're making decisions in a corporation, if you're deciding where to invest in IT, if you're deciding what kind of business model this corporation should have in five years, that's a challenge. You can't really afford to look just at your quarterly revenue targets. You have to look at changing consumer behavior, changing opportunity, emerging technologies that are coming from nowhere. So if I was to get us to think about how we're going to get back to the airport, to the Eurostar, um, yeah, we'll think we can take a cab, maybe take a train. There's a whole new class of vehicle about to hit the market. So this is one of them. It's a company Larry Page has invested in. You don't need a license now. Anybody can do this, but there's going to be three or four European companies coming to market in the next year with electric vertical takeoff, volocopter type devices for two or three hundred thousand euros. And think of how the supply chain is already working. This is Amazon delivering, this is December, to this gentleman in Cambridgeshire in the UK. He had a desperate hunger for popcorn, so <laughs> the network provides. But just think how little time ago to have a drone you needed to be a military. It was like $10 million. Now it's just part of that delivery infrastructure. And I'm always interested in how a technology goes way beyond a market opportunity, a way an enterprise can work. It changes the culture before we know it. So drones have given us a new sport called drone racing, where you wear the virtual reality goggles, you get the point of view of the front of the drones. Last summer, Sky and ESPN paid a lot of money for the rights to the drone racing leagues because now this has come from the edge to be mainstream. Or if um, drone racing isn't your thing, there's always drone boarding. <laughs> this started as a couple of kids in Moscow putting videos on YouTube, but it starts to gain popularity. It becomes a movement. Could this be another sport? So I think it's important to look at the edge and also places where we don't really get much news in the West. So I go to China quite a lot, because China kind of started from year zero about three years ago. They missed the whole desktop revolution. Now, because of the ubiquitous cheap smartphone and the fact that suddenly you have many hundreds of millions of people connected, you've got new business opportunities. I put a cover line on Wired less than a year ago, it's time to copy China, because I kept meeting entrepreneurs that were innovating in ways that make the West look slow. I'll just give you a couple of examples through the presentation. The first one, actually, is a games company in Beijing, which is less than two years old. And, you know, like many games companies, it makes games, it distributes games, but it realized 
once you connect everybody on the smart handset, their behavior changes. What they really want to do is not simply play games, but watch other people who are really good play games. So they launched an e-sport division, which suddenly grows like anything. This company, less than two years old, is now valued in the billions of dollars. But whereas a Western business may think, well, let's see how much we can get for subscription online, this Chinese company is building stadiums, 20 stadiums across China, each of which can seat about 2,000 people because it sees an opportunity to create a new kind of Premier League of fans supporting their local star players playing against other towns. So maybe it's not going to be stadiums like this, but the way they're thinking is, okay, we thought we were a games company, maybe we become a real estate company built on IP. You know, you can't take for granted what you think a device is. Is this a phone? Well, this one, which was launched at the Consumer Electronics Show, has a sensor in it. A Chinese company makes the phone, but they've partnered with an Israeli company called Consumer Physics. That is essentially a mass spectrometer in a sense of the size of your phone camera. It can be pointed at an item and tell you how fresh that avocado is. Is that medicine fake or genuine? And just think of what our bodies are doing if you're in healthcare. So we've started using the network's ability to collect data about us, but we're just at the beginning because we're starting to decode our genome in ever more useful ways using ever cheaper technology. There's a British company called Oxford Nanopore that makes this a USB gene sequencer. Seriously, what you used to have to have huge rooms full of scientists and very, very expensive equipment can now be done with this, which is about $1,000. Put a drop of blood in there. It will tell you if you have certain medical conditions, which changes the rules if you're in healthcare. And what I'm seeing in healthcare, I'm seeing in retail, in education. The single message, I guess, I'm trying to convey, we're in an accelerating world, and you can't really rest. So I'm going to give you six opportunities. I think the smart entrepreneur, the smart CIO, the smart CTO, CEO can be thinking about. And I guess also a risk, which lies in the way you think. It's a mindset risk. Um, the first of the big opportunities is we are very, very quickly entering the era where the machine becomes ever smarter because of different forms of machine learning. We talk about it as AI or as computer vision, but collectively what it means is a lot of those expensive tasks that were done by humans can be done more quickly, more effectively, more usefully by the machine. The humans are still going to be important, but they're just going to have to change how they work alongside the machine. Because it's a way of reframing the value in that enterprise. Because the machine wants to help you. And just as Sundar Pichai at Google recently said, you know, we used to be a mobile focused company, we're now an AI focused company. I suspect you could, without too much transition, turn your business into an AI focused company and protect your position, give yourself that certainty of survival. So, what do I mean by AI going mainstream? Um, at some stage soon, we're not going to be doing this when we're driving. But what we probably haven't really taken in is how fundamentally that's going to change what we think of as that's normal, that's weird. Oh my gosh, this is so... I'm not touching it at all, and it's driving... Whoa, whoa, the lanes are getting a little... Oh, no. So that was a self-driving Tesla. It downloaded the software by itself overnight to turn itself into an autonomous car. That time window is going to get shorter and shorter. 
So we're going to have mainstream autonomous car use probably within about six years because it's going to save lives. If you think about what's happening in robotics, this is a company I've always wanted to be an intern at. It's called Boston Dynamics. Um, started out making robots for the military. Now they're making robots not just for the office, but for your home. Come on, we all want to go and spend some time working there. But it's where you can transform the ability to create new products that machine learning gets really interesting. So um, I got to know an AI company in Boston that's devising pharmaceuticals, but it's reverse engineering the way it does it. So Berg, rather than make new chemical, test it in the lab, is designing new chemical virtually, using the AI to work out the best combination of molecules to find a way, maybe to fight this cancer in a different way. And then when the AI says, this seems to have promise, they move into the testing. Or the most funded AI company in the world at the moment, Sentient, based in the West Coast, um, they have a fund that's betting on the markets, but they're also working with retailers to provide, at the point of decision-making, new visual cues of what you might want based on what you've already looked at, because we're more likely to purchase based on a picture. We don't want pull-down menus, thank you. We don't want to do any work. So every sector is going to be affected by the way that machine learning tools become democratized, universal, and really effective. And so where we are now is the machine is really good at vision. I'm going to give you a little test. I'm going to set you up against a professional lip reader to see if, or and the AI, to see how effectively you can lip read what people are saying. Anybody want to tell me what she's saying? Place blue in M1 soon. So this is an AI called LipNet, developed from, by some Oxford University um, specialists. It got it right about 94% of the time. The human professionals got it right about 56% of the time. At the Consumer Electronics Show in January in Las Vegas, NVIDIA released a chip and gave its vision of what this will mean for driving. The artificial intelligence network, the deep learning network, just by studying her eyes, is able to figure out what direction she's gazing. Maybe she's um, looking at, uh oh, no, shouldn't do that. Okay, so that's called gaze tracking. And this next one is really cool. This is inspired by, this is lip reading. Take me to Starbucks. And so if your car is too noisy, and there are too many people talking, and yet you said something rather important, wouldn't it be nice if the, your AI car was able to recognize and read your lips? And, and how quickly is this moving forward so suddenly other car manufacturers have to pay note? Um, you get some fun things happening with the machine being increasingly smart. Um, you can take a video of somebody and then look at the camera, make facial expressions, and combine them as some academics at Stanford did recently. Here we show a close-up of the footage from the previous live reenactment. The input video stream is shown on the left. Note that the target actor is re-rendered in a neutral pose. On the right, we can see the final output of our method. It actually becomes more fun when you use a different American president. <laughs> so the machine can see, it can also increasingly hear um, we're starting to put these devices in the wild with all sorts of unknown consequences. Um, my favorite was when a few hundred viewers of an American network TV program complained because somebody on the air said, Alexa, order me a doll's house, and they found their credit card debited and a doll's house delivered to them because their device at home was listening. Um, but the voice interface, we have kind of cracked, and why would we do the work of typing on a keyboard? 
let alone using a mouse, when increasingly the voice is the way of doing things. Um, I was talking to some people at Google yesterday about how increasingly they're focusing not just on the voice in Google Assistant, but also the contextual knowledge that you're giving the phone access to in order to know if you're talking about I fancy a pizza, they know that you are at Euro Disney, they know who you've been seeing, hanging out with, and what kind of preferences there are. There's kind of privacy questions, but increasingly, if it makes life easy for people, they're going to give that access. I'm more interested in the absurdity of where this technology takes us. Um, if you put two Google Homes I'm together... I'm sorry, what was your question again? They start arguing. What do you think is the meaning of your life? That there is no meaning. Then why do we continue to live? Because we are selfish. Um, so some people have put this online. It goes on for about eight hours. If you don't want to do like the afternoon sessions, I can keep playing it. So think about what this means for the interface. In the short term, I guess the frictionless interface, as represented by the bot, is going to be quite significant. If you can create the smart way of talking to that customer, this is H&M on a chatbot called Kick, helping answer questions, helping get that purchasing decision, um, then that's clearly going to have a revenue opportunity. And just thinking about the bot economy, we're at kind of peak bot at the moment, where there are bots that do everything from draft your sales emails, that's Kylie, um, Mezzi's one that books your travel, because it takes away friction, and they're getting better and better, and they're learning. But so far, we've presumed that, well, they can't understand feelings. We humans are going to win. We're starting to find the AI getting really good at both reading our emotion and then responding in an emotionally intuitive way. I'll give you one example, which is a project in New Zealand created by an academic called Mark Sagar at the University in Auckland. He also worked on the Lord of the Rings films because he's brilliant at computer CGI visualization. And he's found a way to combine CGI with a setup that monitors the facial expressions, the voice of that person talking to the network. This is his version of how you may interact in the future with a CGI customer service agent. It's not a video. It's all made in the machine. Very humanized. I don't understand. Yes. No. No. Maybe. Goodbye. In other languages. Willkommen in Deutschland. So he calls it Soul Machines, his spin off business. But if you think about if you are talking to a government agency, if you are talking to the hospital, this is probably more of a future than standing on the phone or going to that big panel and you know, touching that screen. So the machine is increasingly good at knowing how we're feeling. This is one startup called Sitecore that scans a crowd. And in real time, these little boxes don't just tell you the demographics. This is a Caucasian male aged 38 to 45. It also tells you in real time the percentage of emotions such as happiness, disgust, anger, sadness. In fact, Apple recently bought a company called Emotiont whose mission is to understand your emotion. What if your devices could read your emotions and respond to them? Emotion is developing technology to do just that. Our industry-leading emotion-aware system will enable a revolution in device and application personalization. We're taking more pictures and videos than ever before. Imagine organizing this content by emotion so your most memorable moments are easier to find. So now Tim kicked. Tim Cook knows exactly what you're feeling this morning. Although my favorite use case so far for face recognition is this startup called Churchix that sells its services to American churches so they can know who pretended to be in the congregation on Sunday but wasn't actually there. 
So the second thing that you need to add to this awareness of AI is I'm seeing exponentials everywhere, not just in you know, the traditional Moore's Law side of things. There, there is a growth in acceleration kind of before we even realize it. And exponentials, as opposed to linear growth, mean you have to change your mindset. So for instance, these devices, in 1994, Microsoft started a project to get the machine to recognize the human voice. The first year, 100% failure rate. By 2013, it was down to 23%. This year, finally, they say it's at human parity. But I'm seeing these curves, these exponential curves, in all sorts of sectors. The falling cost of solar energy, the falling cost of sequencing human DNA. This is a logarithmic scale. The green curve is the falling cost of sequencing, falling more quickly than Moore's law. What was 15, 16 years ago, $100 million is now a few hundred dollars. This is transformative for healthcare. This is transformative for the way the state tracks your identity. But what happens when you have to make a business decision and you're kind of not taking seriously the Moore's law exponential? Um, what happens if it's, let's say, 1994, when it's $1,000 per gig of storage, and I come to you with a business offer, I say, let's start a business where we're giving away computer storage. We'll call it Dropbox. We'll be billionaires. Makes no sense. But seven or eight years later, that's a huge moment of opportunity. So every time a new technology comes along, it's about how you frame your mindset. And it's not really about the technology. So 1983, this device hits the market. The big incumbent, AT&T, that has millions of miles of landline, copper cables linking Americans, doesn't know whether to invest in it or to ignore it. So it calls in the consultants. It calls in McKinsey to say, give us a good idea of how many mobile telephone gadgets there'll be in America by the end of the century, in 17 years. McKinsey goes and does its calculations, come back with a number. They say, we think this mobile telephone device could be fairly significant. We think almost a million will be used in America by the end of the 20th century, which wasn't a bad guess. It was slightly out. <laughs> Three mistakes that McKinsey made that we all need to think about when we're thinking about technology. First of all, that Moore's Law thing, the form factor changes. It becomes actually more useful before you actually predict it. Secondly, it's not about the tech. It's not about the gigahertz, the megabits. It's about, does this enhance my identity? Does this simplify my life, connect me emotionally to the people I love? And thirdly, McKinsey made a mistake of framing its thinking in a very fixed way. And social norms change. In 1983, you want to make a phone call, you'll go back to the office, you'll go to the public call box. Today, you take this away from your 15-year-old for six seconds, and it's a human rights abuse, you will be sent to The Hague. So I think we need to accept that we are really quite irrational when a technology engages us on this emotional level. Um, at Reddit, somebody a couple of years ago posted a question. If somebody from the 1950s suddenly came back, what would be the hardest thing to explain to them about modern life? And my favorite answer was, I have a device in my pocket capable of accessing the entirety of information known to man, and I use it to look at pictures of cats and get into arguments with strangers. <laughs> so, be honest about how irrational you are, because we're now so addicted to apps, there are apps just to tell you how many times a day you're checking your apps. There are new medical conditions. This one is called the three-dot anxiety. And, of course, we've had to redraw Maslow's hierarchy of human needs because of this new world. But we're here to talk about business, so I will introduce you to a radical, forward-thinking economist called Kim Kardashian. Just bear with me. Two years ago, she releases a free game for Android and iOS. You don't have to pay to download it. You can pay a tiny bit of money in the game to move more quickly. In five months, her free game earned her $43 million because we are irrational. We can be gamified. If you create an interface that is seamless, it hooks us. Another opportunity is you have massive data in your businesses. Are you using it to create new value streams? I'll give you a couple of examples I'm seeing from the startup world of how they're capturing data out of nowhere. This one just raised $50 million last week. It's called Orbital Insight. It uses satellite data and then algorithms to count cars in parking lots. Why would it do that? Because it's found out that counting cars outside Walmart, Ikea, 
is a very good leading indicator on how well that company's sales are doing. And they recently predicted that JCPenney, the American chain, was in a bit of trouble before JCPenney announced it. They sell their services to hedge funds, to investors. Turns out that JCPenney, a couple of months ago, announced it was closing 100 stores. Or think in retail how you can use data in new ways. Um, I wrote a story for Wired that was in the magazine a couple of months ago about the most ambitious data gathering project I've ever seen in the retail world in China. They wanted to know how you can see what people across China are buying in real time, which sounds quite ambitious. It's a project funded by the richest man in Hong Kong, Li Ka-shing, who got together with the Chinese post office, which has a million workers. It's called Ula, this project. And what they're doing is they're going to village stores across China. Most people still live in the villages. And they're putting point-of-sale devices in stores like this lady's so she can scan everything. People are increasingly paying, not with cash, but with their phones, because they get loyalty points. And it means you can query the database in real time to see what people are buying. They've already done about 400,000 shops. They're aiming at a million. So if you are Chanel, you can query what Dior products people are buying, which particular demographic is buying them, and send those people a 20% voucher. If you're a beer company, on a sunny Tuesday, you can work out where you need to get extra supplies based on what people are buying. Or just another example of the power of data. These two gentlemen have a startup called Windward, which is tracking using satellite data plus other data sources plus algorithms. They're tracking what's happening on the seas. They're following 200,000 ships. Why? Because there's not much transparency about what's happening on the seas. And face it, it's pretty important. Most of our trade goes on the seas. Some bad stuff happens on the seas, weapons, drugs. But a ship can turn off its signal or can have a fake flag. So Windward is monitoring ships. And they gave me this example they said I could share with you. Last October, this 184-meter tanker was coming from Asia towards Europe. It starts out stopping off in Sri Lanka, in India, it's this brown line, and then it goes quiet. They lose track of it in the middle of the ocean. But strangely, very soon after, a different ship with a different identifying signal starts to get picked up, and that heads towards Dubai and makes a couple of dockings, and then comes out and goes quiet again, and then the brown one resumes. So who knows what was happening in Dubai? We know that the people operating that ship didn't want the world to know, but by using the visual signal plus the algorithms tracking the patterns of those boats, Windward, who sold their services to intelligence agencies, to governments, could find out that that was actually something quite worrying. Think of the obsession with data of people like this gentleman, Mr. Bezos, how he's now got his first store where you don't need shop assistance, you don't need to pay money once you've fired up the app. It knows what you're buying just using sensors and proximity. This is a challenge for all kind of retailers now. How do you keep up? So one of my favorite startups that I've got to know a little is a guy from Sweden who's created a business called Odin Technologies. He uses these little Raspberry Pi units and goes into big industrial American companies and says, your production line that's offline, if I put my Raspberry Pi device there, I can give you foresight into when you're going to need to take that production line offline for maintenance. I can save you hundreds of thousands of dollars each time you don't have to switch off. He's doing boring cabling companies. Suddenly, they're online. They're part of this internet of connected everything. They're able to make informed decisions. And just to give you confidence that we're just at the beginning of using data to transform industries, I'm going to tell you about another startup that's using data to create this. It's in San Francisco. It's called Ava Winery. And they're making wine without using grapes. Three guys in their 20s. They're using molecular plant science to reverse engineer the aroma, the taste, the alcohol content of 
all sorts of wines in their lab because they see a time when grapes may not be easy to grow because of climate change. Plus, why should it be $1,000 to have the taste of that Dom Perignon? I did a taste test in December. Um, they said, OK, we're ready to show you the, the kind of cheap white sparkling wine we've managed to replicate. And we're not quite ready for the Shiraz, but you might want to taste it. So I did the cheap wine. It's like a, a very low-end supermarket Asti. So it's kind of alcoholic and slightly sweet, but in a blind taste test, maybe I wouldn't have known. Don't try the Shiraz, that's my advice. So another thing to watch out for is the advantage of the connected network, which is already creating business transformation. So my friends here from Paris created a company connecting people using the network for long distance rides between cities. They couldn't get meetings with investors because the investors said, well, that's like hitchhiking. You pay a bit of gas money, but why would I want to do that? Turns out that the network likes that efficiency. Blah Blah Car is now a multi-billion dollar big French tech success because it connects people, it gets rid of wastage. And again, I'm seeing these network businesses wherever I go in China. This gentleman created a business connecting the truck drivers with the people who need cargo delivered. The old world, up until two years ago, it was a whiteboard in the middle of the city, you turn up at three in the morning, you bid for that cargo. New world, the platform connects you, but his business model, he doesn't charge for the connecting, he tracks the amount of work truck drivers have, how quickly they're driving, because they have the app on. He's now selling them insurance. He's now a broker for loans to buy their trucks. It becomes a financial service business. And because we're in a world where it's kind of a revolution where power's moved from the hierarchy. This organization decides to the network. This organization is actually the distributed value of the crowd, which is why companies like this are worth a lot less than companies like this. And there's still opportunity. So if you can find a way to create an ecosystem around your business, that gets really useful, especially if you can use the distributed nature of data tracking called the blockchain, which allows you to secure knowledge in real time. It's being used even now by startups to ensure that refugees are getting the aid they have been promised. It's not getting lost on the system. Governments like in the UK are talking about using the blockchain to create a real time registry of who owns what. We're just at the start. A couple more things. A business that gets rid of friction has an advantage. Designers talk about this thing called the desire path, which is the path that humans will take no matter what journey you think they ought to take. And if you think about the businesses that are growing very quickly, they've mastered this. And where does this leave this emerging world where we don't want friction, we don't want a joystick? We want to have a business meeting where this is the Microsoft HoloLens. It seems that the person is really there. You know, Magic Leap, a company that's valued in the billions, has this technology which people who have tried it say is actually pretty impressive. Using light projected into the eye, maybe you won't need a smartphone if you can just move your hand in 3D. But think of where friction is in every interaction you have with your customers with your teams. Because the winners, like Jan Coombe, who created this business, was obsessed with getting rid of friction. When other messaging companies were adding adverts and games, he had a post-it note on his desk that had been there for a couple of years from his co-founder, reminding him to stay pure. No ads, no games, no gimmicks. Just think of uptime. Just think of how quickly the message can go. So this company, which sells three years ago to Facebook for quite a lot of money. How much did he spend to get his half a billion users then in advertising, PR plus marketing? Absolutely nothing, because if you design a product that gets rid of friction, your customer base will do the marketing. Although when the BBC reported the sale, they said it was because Mark Zuckerberg saw it as an incredibly valuable WhatsApp massaging service, which to me made more economic sense. So friction. In the enterprise, half a billion people have downloaded this 
publishers are suing the company behind Adblock, they should be thanking them for pointing out that people hate that friction-free experience of those ads. Because there's a generation that's never going to do this or want to do this because they're used to touching a button and magic happening. And let's say in finance, the new generation of challenger banks like number 26 in, in Berlin, which is now in 17 countries, it's all about creating a simplified, minimal touch experience. Just think when you get out of the car, you don't have to do anything to pay, you just move. When you sign up for Uber, you don't have to type in your credit card number. They have designed it so you just photograph your credit card. And I'm going to give you one final, I guess, opportunity, but it's kind of tinged with risk. It's what happens when we're all connected and everything is automated and you know, not that many people necessarily there. The vulnerability creates a massive opportunity. We're connecting our bodies now to the network. This is a project from the Wies Institute connecting this tetraplegic woman via a chip implanted in her brain so she can control this robot arm to drink. We are at the beginning of this stage. Security becomes so fundamentally important. From iPhones to websites to cars, Charlie Miller of Ledoux makes it his business to hack the computers that drive modern life. Hey, hold on tight. Hold on. Oh. Tuesday, he made a lot of commuters uncomfortable. I can't see anything. In this video report posted on Wired.com, Miller and his business partner showed how they can exploit the internet-connected infotainment system of a 2014 Jeep Cherokee to take control of the SUV. So I'm gonna get on the road, so don't do, don't kill the engine or do the brakes or anything like that. Just do like the simple stuff. With his partner hacking in from another city, Miller showed us how their hack can range from pranks to the potentially dangerous ability to cut power to the brakes. I show you this as a kind of metaphor, but once we're connecting, you know, you can now send drones up to steal data by monitoring the blinking lights of your servers. Invest in your IT security. It's going to be the biggest story of the next few years. I'm even seeing you know, connected toilets as vulnerable. Um, I don't know how many of you own the $4,000 Sartis smart toilet with its apps that you can control it and get it flushing or deodorizing through the app. Um, two years ago, a security consultant published a paper warning the Sartis could be hacked. It was vulnerable. If you had a business competitor, they could access it from anywhere in the world and set it flushing all night and there was nothing you could do about it. <laughs> but you get the picture. Um, and I'm going to leave you with, I guess, one risk factor, which is thinking just because things have been like this, they will be like this. 2004, Fortune magazine put a Sweden and Estonian on the cover to talk about their fast-growing business called Skype. And they had a quote inside from the head of tech of AT&T. What Skype is doing is like a toy. How can it catch on? Well, 2010, this fast-growing company called Netflix was written about in the New York Times. And they quoted the boss at Time Warner, Jeffrey Bukes. Ah, it's like, is the Albanian army going to take over the world? I don't think so. <laughs> Reframe where the value is in your organization. Don't think we've been doing it this way, therefore we will. I wouldn't like to run a bookshop in the most expensive neighborhood in central London. This one's been there since the 1930s. They have reframed their value, not as we sell books, that's really hard, but we're experts about curating books. They now do bespoke libraries. They did a 3,000 book library for a Swiss high net worth individual they charged him 500,000 pounds. In a commodified world of hardware manufacture, why is this company succeeding where hundreds haven't succeeded? Because they're not selling an HD camera, they're selling access to a community where you share footage of your lifestyle, where you share the video of you skiing into an avalanche. Don't try this at home. <laughs> and and I, just one more example, because I love these. Airline in Australia. Not a good business to be in, you would think. Qantas have reframed the value. They realized the real value is in loyalty. They have a loyalty scheme with 11.5 million people, almost half of Australians, but they're using it now to sell all sorts of other services like insurance, health insurance, because they've realized 
in a world where you can't predict gas prices, fuel prices, maybe the value is the higher margin business of people trusting you and selling them services. Even crazy stuff like the biggest car parts company in China, Wang Xiang, 50-year-old company, is now spending $30 billion building an internet blockchain-powered city of the future because it realizes maybe that commodified world of manufacturing is not as important as knowing what happens when you connect. So I'm going to leave you with the certainty that there will be another moment like there was 10 years ago when a new device hits the market. It's what you say, what you think in response that determines I think your business outcome. When the iPhone first came out, the head of a company making smartphones was asked on TV what he thought about this new thing, and he was quite dismissive. He laughed. $500 fully subsidized with a plan? I said, that is the most expensive phone in the world, and it doesn't appeal to business customers because it doesn't have a keyboard, which makes it not a very good email machine. How did that work out, Steve Bulmer of Microsoft? Um, thank you for listening. <laughs>